Hey everyone, this is Ben from Questing Beast. In this video, I'd like to do an introduction to the OSR, or Old School Renaissance, which is a unique creative scene within the Dungeons and Dragons subculture. Now, if you're watching this video, you probably already know what the OSR is, given that my channel focuses so much on reviewing OSR books. However, what I've discovered is that as D&D 5e continues to expand and become bigger and bigger across pop culture, more and more people are being pulled into the hobby and may not be aware of what is so fascinating about this particular niche. So let's start at the beginning. What is the old school renaissance? Well, in essence, it's a re-exploration of early D&D and the rules and the adventures found there. We're talking about going all the way back through original D&D, sometimes referred to as zeroth edition, through BX D&D, that's basic and expert sets released after OD&D, all the way through AD&D, known as Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, or first edition. So the question often arises, why would we even want to look at older rule sets? We're on the fifth edition of the game now. Haven't the rules been dramatically cleaned up and improved over the years since the 70s and 80s? Why would we want to look back at these older rules? What is interesting there that we might find? Well, to answer that question, let's look at my journey into the OSR. My journey started about six years ago when I was playing a lot of Pathfinder. And I was having a lot of fun with my friends. But the rule set was not really lining up with what I wanted out of a role-playing game. When I imagine d and I imagined things like crazy, unusual worlds to explore. I imagined um, games that were very player-led, where there was simply a setting and then you were an adventurer and you set out and you had adventures. Things were player-led rather than following a particular plot laid out by the DM. I wanted combat that was fast and furious. I wanted a high level of wonder and also danger, um, real genuine danger, present in my games. And I wasn't seeing a lot of that in the Pathfinder system. And when I was struggling with all of these conflicts, I discovered the OSR blogs. I didn't really understand this subculture that I had stumbled into, but the sheer level of imagination on display hooked me immediately. The monsters, the spells, the worlds, the character classes being created blew out of the water anything that I was reading from Wizards of the Coast. It was just so incredibly imaginative and strange and refreshing. And also these people were publishing. They had recently harnessed the power of print-on-demand publishing from places like Lulu and DriveThruRPG to put out full-length books, often fully illustrated and just beautiful looking, uh, featuring their worlds and creations. The question was, where had this scene come from? Why had I never heard from them before? And what was it that made all of their work so unique and engaging? It turns out that this whole thing started back with the OGL from 3rd edition. A bunch of fans of AD&D realized that they could use the OGL to do a recreation of Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons. And they would just want to clean it up. They want to make it more streamlined, easier for modern players to read. Since if you've ever tried to read original AD&D, it's a mess. It's really hard to learn how to play from that. So they tested this out. They created a rule set called Osric, which is the old school uh, reference and index compendium, I think is what it stands for. And this set the precedent. Once they managed to get away with this, essentially, it became the first retro clone. And from there, more people in the old school scene, people who were interested in these old rules, started doing the same thing with other editions of D&D, rebuilding their rules in a streamlined and easier to learn format, and then publishing them under different names without using the official Dungeons and Dragons brand name. The creation of these retro clones allowed the community to expand very quickly because new people could learn how to play the old games um, much more efficiently than if they had just bought the original books. The creation of the internet, of course, also allowed all of these old school players, some of them who were brand new and had just discovered old school D&D, and some of them who had been playing since the 70s, it allowed them to all find each other. And they quickly began building a miniature blogosphere where they would talk about the things that they were discovering. They talked about why the rules were written the way they were. Perhaps they weren't as arbitrary and strange as they first seemed and building a theory of how old school D&D worked, why it worked the way it did, and why it was interesting to play that way. What I found fascinating about these discussions was that there was clearly something about the style of play afforded by the rules of old school D&D that these authors really loved. They weren't really in it for the nostalgia. I mean, it's possible that some of the older players were in it for the nostalgia. Some of them had been playing since the 70s, so that would be understandable. But a lot of my favorite authors, some of my favorite bloggers, were clearly 
not in it for the nostalgia. They were my age or younger. Some of them had only discovered D&D within the last five years or so. So they weren't drawing upon nostalgia to fuel their creations. There was something in the way that the game was played that captivated them. As the OSR scene has evolved, I think this style of play has become one of its central hallmarks. Other elements of it have altered over time, uh, from the tone, which can range anywhere from a grim, dark savagery all the way up through a very lighthearted, almost anime-inspired style, uh, all the way through the rules, which can be very detailed and procedural, all the way through being very loose and hand-wavy. But the assumptions about how you play the game and these core principles have remained mostly the same. So what is this OSR style of play? The answer, of course, is going to vary from table to table, but there were definitely some features in common that I observed most people talking about and seemed to form the core of the OSR style. First of all, a focus on exploration and sandbox style games, where players take control of the session and set their own goals. One of the most interesting rules from early D&D is the fact that almost all experience points are given for recovering gold rather than killing monsters. This seems like an odd rule at first, but it's actually a really brilliant piece of game design because of what it does is it makes the game focused on exploration, delving into forgotten places, and finding all of the secrets there rather than simply killing everything in your way. It makes the game much more thinky and much less about being a murder hobo. Secondly, a focus on creative problem solving. So in OSR games, your character sheets tend to be much more minimal. There are much fewer special abilities available for you to use, and your success is going to depend much more on your ability to think your way out of problems rather than either fighting your way out, using special abilities to get out, and so on. Your strategic approach as a player becomes extremely important. Uh, for me, this makes the game highly immersive because it lessens the barrier between me as a player and me as a character. I feel more like I'm there because I have to make the decisions that get me out of this problem rather than simply rolling intelligence or rolling investigation. I have to do it myself. I feel like I'm there and there's more responsibility on me. And that is just delightful to me. I love that experience. Third, a almost total disregard for encounter balance. And counterbalance is a concept that was really focused on in 3rd through 5th edition, where the idea was that if you ran into some monsters or any sort of foe, they were essentially there to be killed. Um, and it wouldn't cost you too many resources. You could get into 3, 4, 5, 6 fights a day and probably survive. In old school D&D, this is not the assumption. The assumption is that monsters are there, they are dangerous, and they will kill you if you don't fight them intelligently. Or perhaps, maybe the better option is not to fight them at all. Using things like diplomacy and stealth are critical in surviving in an old school game. You treat the world like it's real. If you wander into a monster lair, like a dragon lair, there's probably a dragon there. And you'll have to deal with the consequences of your choices. I love this feeling of verisimilitude in the world, where everything feels like it is where it naturally would be, which allows you to plan in a more open sandbox style game. Fourth and finally, a do-it-yourself attitude. One of the most refreshing things about discovering this scene was the way that no one would wait for official Wizards of the Coast permission to do anything. There was a healthy disrespect for official canon, official lore, official rules even. If you wanted something done, you rolled up your sleeves and you did it yourself. Everyone was taking the rules and just hacking them apart. They were creating their own settings, their own monsters, their own spells. Nothing was sacred. You pulled it apart, you put it back together the way that was right for you and for your table, and then you shared it with everyone else so everyone could reap the benefits of the things that you were doing. Skipping up to modern day, the OSR has gotten bigger than ever before. It's gone from a tiny little blogger scene to having, I think, 17 separate nominations at the most recent Any Awards for different OSR products. Uh, the increased attention has also allowed the OSR to greatly expand the kinds of OSR books that are being made. So there are some OSR authors that are creating Kickstarters that are making more than $100,000. The quality of the books has also shot through the roof. We're seeing a lot of authors abandon the print-on-demand format and doing full-on offset print runs with a level of quality that meets or exceeds anything being put out by major companies. We're talking about things like Smith's own bindings, faux leather covers, built-in bookmarks, and innovative layout that makes adventures radically easier to use and play at the table. If you want to delve deeper into some of the best books being put out by this scene, you're in the right place. This channel does regular reviews of OSR books. 
Uh, I do detailed, comprehensive flip throughs of them while talking about some of their best features. So you can see inside the book, you can see exactly what you're getting and what it is that makes it worth purchasing. Also, if you're not into the old school rules, maybe you're more of a fifth edition person, then these books can still be very valuable. Most of them are very easily converted to 5e if that's what you prefer. And even if you don't, many of the ideas can be transported right over and are just as fascinating and useful. If you're looking for a place to start, especially when it comes to adventures, I would look at things like Winter's Daughter or Gardens of Yin, Tomb of the Serpent Kings, and maybe Fever Swamp. These are all fascinating little adventures uh, that are a great introduction to the OSR style of play. Uh, they're not too complicated, but they feature a lot of interesting innovations that I think 5e players would find really fascinating. If you're looking for things like OSR sets of rules, probably the gold standard right now is Old School Essentials, which is previously known as BX Essentials. Um, this is great if you really want that authentic um, early D&D set of rules. If you want something a little bit more modern, streamlined, and simplified, you might want to try my recent rule set, Nave. Links to all this I'll put down in the description below. So that's it for this introduction or overview of the OSR, the D&D old school renaissance. If you found it interesting, remember to leave a subscription below that'll also keep you caught up when I release new reviews of OSR books and you can always stay on top of new releases. You can click the bell icon as well. That will make sure that you actually get notified when new releases drop. Thanks for watching everybody. See you guys next time.